Good day, everyone. This is Chris with the Ancient Scholar. So as you can tell, something rather uh, interesting was going on at the beginning of this video, and uh, this is actually a uh, video that will um, introduce you guys uh, to a, a lab that I do as a part of a physics course that I teach. This is a physics for respiratory therapists it's called Respiratory Physics uh, RESP 115. It's a second semester a physics course the, all the respiratory therapy students have to complete um, at the, the college where I teach it's a community college it's a two year program and um, I was able to have a lot of freedom in uh, designing the course this semester and I wanted to include a, a little more comprehensive course that covered both uh, some classical and quantum mechanics. Uh, obviously, um, you know, due to due to time limitations and um, the fact that I can't you know, mandate uh, a true calculus-based course, um, I had to be very careful how I went about it. But um, this is one of the labs that I've, I've always really wanted to integrate into uh, what I do, and uh, it actually worked out real well. So, uh, basically, what we have here is we. We talk a little bit about uh, quantum mechanics, and if you're familiar with my videos, you've probably seen them already, and you you understand that um, there are a lot of really, really non-intuitive things that quantum mechanics predicts. You have particles behaving like waves, wave beha waves behaving like particles, and ultimately they're they're neither, and it's just uh, basically modeling wave and particle-like behavior, and you have this this crazy quantization of energy and um, you have uncertainty in position and momentum, and uh, everything is probabilistic, and you have probability density, um, determining position. Uh, you know, the, 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 co the classical concept of position doesn't even exist, and it's just all a really confusing mess. And one of the things I like to do is say, hey, you know, even though this is very confusing and it's not intuitive, the solutions... Uh, of this this math, the, the, the quantitative solutions, uh, in fact, predict the physical world. And this is one of the labs, I think, really, um, you can intuitively, qualitatively, and quantitatively make some sense of what's going on here. So what we do is we take, if you look on the left there, we take the time-independent Schrodinger equation, H, uh, H hat psi equals each psi, and we know that E is an, eigen, uh, an eigenvalue, um, more uh, importantly or appropriately, this level it's uh, it uh, is a its solution tells us uh, an energy, a very special type of energy, and it's energy that binds an electron to the nucleus of an atom, uh, specifically the hydrogen atom in this case. And um, from the E, and you've seen me do this on other videos, uh, it basically pull out the formula negative one over n squared multiplied by uh, mass uh, charge on the electron to the fourth over um, 8 epsilon naught squared h squared and basically we can uh, we're, uh, h squared of course is Planck's constant and epsilon naught is a permittivity of the vacuum and basically it's just a constant and basically what we can do is we can take all that and can condense it down into r sub h or um, the Rydberg constant and that further reduces into uh, the negative Rydberg constant divided by n squared equals the energy of the electron. And then what I what I did with the class is I said, okay, let's start at n equals 1, the ground state of the hydrogen atom, and then n equals 2, the first excited state, 3, the second excited state, all the way up to n equals 6. And we calculated the energy levels, and then we converted uh, that into electron volts, because when you, when you initially calculate it, you plug n in there, and you square n, um, and then uh, the Rydberg, the negative Rydberg constants divided uh, by n squared, um, and that gives you an answer in joules. And I just simply converted joules over to electron volts because the numbers are a little easier to deal with. And then I said, okay, well, um, again, this is what the mathematics is predicting. Um, and then there's a, you know, uh, n equals uh, one. You're at negative 13.06 electron volts. N equals two is a negative three and some change, and so on and so forth. And then what I did is I said, okay, well, here are the energies, and these are quantized energies, and that the electrons are basically bound to these levels of energy. There is no 1.5 or anything like that. Um, so I said, well, as non-intuitive as, non as this may seem, 
you know, does it, can we somehow test it? Is it, is it falsifiable? Can we um, use the scientific method to prove or disprove uh, quantum mechanics? And I said, well, if we take hydrogen and we excite it, and maybe I can get the electron to n all the way up to n equals 6 there, um, I know that if I wait a certain amount of time, the electron will want to fall back down. And what if it fell from n equals 6 all the way down to n equals 2? Well, whatever the difference is between 6 and 2 in electron volts, the energy that the electron would release as it fell from 6 to 2, you know, whatever that energy is, um, I should be able to calculate the wavelength of that. And that's, in fact, what I did, is I calculated the wavelength, um, uh, from n equals 6 to 2, n equals 5 to 2, n equals 4 to 2, n equals 3 to 2, those, those four transitions specifically. And I said, you know, if we took some hydrogen and maybe we put an electrical potential across it and excited it, um, we would expect the hydrogen to give off those wavelengths of light and really no other wavelengths, um, you know, because there's no in-between stuff. And so what I did is I converted uh, the difference uh, in electron volts between the different transitions and just converted that over to a uh, wavelength, uh, lambda. This is some very simple, uh, you know, all of the conversions are really just very simple dimensional analysis um, will allow you to, you know, go back and forth between electron volts, joules, um, and wavelength. And what we did is we said, okay, well, if the 3 to 2 transition um, is going to, be at about 656 nanometers. Um, the n equals 4 to 2 is going to be in uh, 480, 490. I can't, I can't remember off the top of my head. The 5 to 2 um, is going to be even smaller. And then the 6 to 2, I think, is going to be about 410 nanometers, even smaller yet. Um, so um, we should expect a red light. Uh, we should expect some red light to be given off and then some blue light and you know collectively that'll kind of uh, be kind of a purplish violet kind of and then I talked to them uh, about uh, taking the light uh, that the hydrogen would give off if we could excite it and breaking the light up into its spectrum and I said if we could use something like a diffraction grating or a better yet a spectrometer which has a prism in it we can break that light up and we can actually see these very uh, bright lines of color and if the quantum mechanical theory is correct, if it is correct, we should expect to see a very bright red line at about the 650, 656 nanometer um, range and we should expect to see three fairly distinct um, lines of blue light. And uh, the beginning of the video uh, I, that was actually uh, the uh, hydrogen emission tube, or what we call a Geisler tube, that we used in lab. And I showed you a very crude method of just using um, what are called rainbow glasses that have a diffraction grating in them. And if you go back and look at that, you can see there's there's a very bright, um, very bright uh, red line, and some very bright blue lines in there. And then what I did is I um, used the spectrometer, and we looked actually looked through it. Um, with a camera, and you could see a very bright red line, a very bright blue line, and then um, a couple of uh, two other bright br blue lines, and those are all toward about the 400 nanometers on the scale, and of course the red uh, line was right at about the 656 nanometers, um, and then of course uh, we I had the students go through, do the lab, um, draw their findings, do a lab report, and we came to the conclusion that as non-intuitive as this quantum mechanics stuff is, the solutions of the Schrodinger equation um, really do uh, predict um, physical reality, and it actually predicts what we see when we um, experiment uh, with the equations. So it works. It's a really good lab to do. And I just wanted to uh, conclude this uh, video with a, a picture um, that I took through the spectrometer. This is actually with my iPhone. It's, it's a little difficult to see, and actually, I actually think the spectrum turns out a little better at the beginning of the video when I'm filming uh, the video. But you can see here 
uh, between the 6 and 700 nanometers, uh, right about 650 nanometers, I have a very bright, distinct red line. Uh, and this is actually, we predict that this emission line would exi exist. This is predicted from the mathematics of the Schrodinger equation. And then you can see right there between 4 and 500, a little closer to 500, I have a very bright blue line. That was also predicted. And then you can kind of see closer to the 400, you can kind of see where there's a bump, a bump there. And those two lines kind of blended into one another on this picture. Uh, but if you go back to the beginning of the video, you can actually see the, the two um, the, the two uh, lines that are closer to one is at 410, and I think the other is about 430. Um, those two emission lines uh, are a lot clearer, a lot easier to see. And, uh, and you know, clearly this is a, a good quantitative lab and a good qualitative lab. And it's also nice because you can talk to people about you know how can we tell you know how what certain stars or planets are made of um, and this is one of the ways we can do it is we can look at light from, from those objects and we can break the light up into these colors and we can look at the bright emission lines and we can predict um, what these certain objects you know have in them you know hydrogen helium nitrogen so on and so forth every element has its own distinct uh, set of what we call emission lines. So it's always something I would want to emphasize in in um, in these labs just to help with a, a greater appreciation for the, for the world and the universe as a whole. Okay, guys, uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and cut it off here. Uh, hopefully, you enjoyed this video. I really enjoyed doing this lab, and you know it's a relatively easy lab to do. In the mathematics, um, they're not not particularly difficult. It's a pretty decent lab, um, pretty high yield um, lab you can do, assuming that you can get a hold of the equipment, of course. Okay, guys, um, as always, thanks for hanging in there.